What is up, Comeback Period Nation, and welcome to the first episode, official first episode of For Better, For Worse, here on the Comeback Period. This is the podcast version, and it'll be on YouTube podcasts and many more platforms, including Apple, Spotify, and many other platforms out there. So let's go ahead We'll dive into introductions first and foremost, and then we'll get into the key points about today, the great merger of the USFL and XFL. I'm your co-host, Brandon Anderson, the host of the comeback period, and here is my beautiful wife, Angie. Hello, I am Angie, and as Brandon mentioned, I am his wife. Um, lover of football as well, not as qu- not quite as crazy as the husband, but getting there. All right, so on this first edition of the show, here is kind of the rules. So on the first one, we're just going to pre-pick what we have decided. So um, Angie will take the pro side, which is the for better. And then I will take the con side, which is the for worse. So basically, usually as we go forward throughout the season, we will be doing weekly episodes based on the previous week. So week one, next week, we'll talk about the pros and cons of week one, for better, for worse, or whatever you want to call it. So first and foremost, we are talking today about the great merger and what this could mean for spring football going into the future. Um, She'll take the for better side and I'll take the worst side, which is a little different for me. And she kind of wanted me to take the con side today because I am so pro spring football. So I'll be taking that con side and the for worse side. So let's go ahead. Let's kick this inaugural episode off heading into the inaugural season of the UFL that kicks off this Saturday, March 30th from Arlington, Texas. Let's go ahead and dive right on into it. All right, so we are looking at the pro side or the for better side of the merger here. And the biggest pro side that's come across has been um, that it seemed counterproductive for the two leagues to compete against each other when they were both still trying to find their feet and looking to be financially stable. Now, most of my information will be coming from uh, sportspromedia.com. It was an article that was out there by Ed Dixon on March 22nd. So with being able to merge, yes, there was trimming of teams, of the 16 teams down to eight, letting staff go, but they have a better feeling of stability. They've combined resources and consolidated the talent pool and this, the intention of this is to create a viable spring league that will hopefully be around for the long term. Um, number one is to grow the game of football. A, that sounded counterintuitive when they're trimming teams, but understanding that they're able to grow the, the game of football by having, again, the, the better talent pool, for lack of a better term, or um, bigger talent pool to be able to showcase these players in their best forms and hopefully also be able to grow the fan bases in these eight cities that are represented in the league now. They are looking at the two conferences almost being comparative to the NFL of the AFC versus NFC. So since it's four teams from each of the prior leagues, they're able to maintain some of that delineation where they're coming together for a championship, much like a Super Bowl type championship, if we're comparing to the NFL. Um, Since they have been able to continue as conferences, they are still being able to keep pre-existing sponsorships. Um, The biggest one has been Under Armour since they had a deal with the XFL. It's deepened their commitment by becoming the technical apparel partner of the UFL in an agreement that covers everything from player uniforms to fan gear. And yes, I did order my husband fan gear for his birthday. Um, Also with that, they've been able to um, have some of these big major broadcast partners 
um, and being able to to keep on these media giants and they will be looking at having all of the games um, will be split across Fox, Fox, Fox Sports 1, ESPN, ESPN 2, and ABC, as well as streamed on either ESPN Plus or the Fox Sports app, as well as radio broadcasts will be on Sirius XM. Um, so it is exciting to have the defending champions kick us off on March 30th. Um, I will miss my husband while he's down seeing that game live, and I'm taking care of the children. <laughs> but it'll be exciting to see what that brings to this league as it's kicked off um, with those big championships um, or the champions taking on um, a fresh start to a new league. Um, so really the biggest pro is being able to combine these leagues into one. Um, again, being able to have another place where these players can be showcased to get promoted to the NFL. It's also taking on opportunities for people, not just the players, but also um, some of the referees have been able to be promoted. The officials were promoted from the XFL and USFL to the NFL. So they are really opening doors for a lot of people across the board, not just players. Um, but they also hope some of their talent sticks around because that's that's what's growing these leagues is being able to have talent, keep talent, um, open up doors for more athletes that may not have other opportunities as they continuously, unfortunately, get cut from the NFL um, as some of those NFL giants do stick around for a long time. Looking at you, Tom Brady. Um, so it's just, it's an interesting and I think being able to consolidate down to a smaller a smaller one team versus the the two leagues prior they will hopefully be able to find some stability really dig into what's going to help them be successful and then grow from there hopefully back to some of those cities that were represented prior um as i lost both of my teams in the cuts <laughs> i'm looking to get some of those fan bases back um or grow into different cities that would also be great fan bases and great places for for a team to exist. All right, so with the pros now being covered slash um, whatnot, I will head into the cons that kind of you can be a little bit back and forth with because when we're looking at the UFL and the combination of the USFL and XFL, obviously... As it was mentioned in the pro side, we know that rosters, players, coach, jobs, and everything like that, and I've talked about it on the comeback period show, in the cons of cutting talent. Now, of course, and giving less opportunities. When the merger happened, a lot were expecting potentially 12 teams to all 16 teams, and that just did not happen. So when you look at the, the con side of things, and this actually comes from a fan base compared to a media base, and this was actually some potential drawbacks to a merger between the XFL and USFL um, that was wrote almost a year ago at this point before we even knew about a merger, is the uh, big one was brand confusion. If the XFL and USFL were to merge, there could be potential brand confusion among fans, sponsors, and the general public. Both leagues have their own unique brand identities and histories, and merging them might require careful rebranding and marketing efforts to ensure a cohesive and clear message about the new entity. And that's kind of what we've got with the UFL, the United Football League, but it can cause some brand confusion because they are still using the USFL and the XFL as conferences, um, sort of like the NFL and the AFL did back in the day when they originally merged. This can create a lot of confusion, and I've already seen confusion because for the UFL, most all their social media accounts are still XFL platforms. Yes, they have the UFL picture, and they have all those type of things, but they are still on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. It's at XFL 2023 still. Same with Instagram. 
I have recently heard that TikTok or one of the social media platforms like TikTok, um, recently they have finally changed it to the UFL. But these other platforms, social media platforms, they're having a hard time doing it because of the original UFL has all those social media platforms locked up and who knows who has those accounts. So the brand confusion can be quite interesting, including just the other day, Dwayne The Rock Johnson uh, put out a, a tweet to Larry David, or uh, Larry David from Seinfeld, is that correct? Um, or sure. Davidson, I think. Anyways, um, he had talked about uh, basically the UFL removing goalposts, and he was joking on one of the night shows about it, um, or the uh, Rich Eisen show. And The Rock tweeted out about it and was like, in the XFL, we did this, we were innovative, blah, blah, blah. But tune in to the US or the UFL next week or whatever the case may be but because he tagged the social media page it came up as at XFL 2023 and not the UFL so the the tweet looks very off and it was confusing people in the comments were even like oh can't wait for the XFL to come back or start again that's not happening and that's where I think the brand identity of taking a former Football League, the United Football League, and making that your new name creates even more brand confusion when it comes to the USFL and XFL merger. Then, of course, we uh, take a look back at that talent pool in the player contracts. Merging two football leagues may lead to a larger talent pool of players, which can be beneficial. However, managing player contracts, salaries, and potential conflicts between existing players from each league could be a complex task. Balancing the interests and expectations of players and their respective agents during the merger process could be a potential challenge. We did see this with the United Football or the USFL's PA. And the collective bargain and all that type of stuff that happened in those processes. Now, at least since the merger was officially official, we've not really heard anything from the UFLPA. And that can cause some issues with player contracts, talent pool, things like that. Because we are cutting all these players. And, I mean, we have seen through the final player cuts that happened earlier this week that a lot of players that were expected to be on some of these rosters are no longer on them, which is potentially a really bad thing for the worst part of it. Um, that could be construed as the fact that some people are losing out the opportunity to have that uh, that chance to get back in the NFL or show their talents like they did last year in the XFL or the USFL. So cutting those teams was a huge con, but if they're looking to expand down the road, I guess that could help that, but I still think that could create another con, which was the financial considerations. As we all know, mergers like this one can be costly Endeavors combining two leagues may involve substantial financial investments, including legal fees, administration expenses, marketing campaigns, restructuring costs, ensuring long-term financial uh, sustainability and profitability for the merged entity could be a significant challenge, which has been essentially talked about going into this merger. Obviously, they had to go through the federal government, the FTC and the Department of Justice for um, issues Now, going back to the article that Angie was talking about with the Sports Pro Media, Russ Brandon was basically talking about the financial issues, essentially that they kind of came into it with like the commercial side of things and what exactly success looks like when it comes to the UFL and what the future holds. Um... Obviously, they said you never, or he states, the thing you can never replicate is the relationships, the camaraderie, and the locker room. Anyone who's ever played will tell you that that's what you miss. And I think that's kind of goes back to that player structure is you're missing a lot of that when you cut teams, 
you have less pay. Some players decided to retire because of the pay, and there wasn't a bump in pay for these players because they merged together. Instead of merging together, cutting teams, and raising the pay for those eight teams, they kept the pay the same and then also kept like cut teams. So I think that was a really poor decision in that realm, but it could be financial stability for the future. But when Russ Brandon talks about this, he says there's no firm KPI um, numbers in place, which if you don't know what KPI means, um, basically is key performance indicator numbers um, of how they would be successful in 2024 with the UFL season. He says that profitability for the UFL may have to wait, but packing out stadiums, establishing fan bases in local markets, securing healthy TV viewership, and ensuring a good experience for players will be vital from the beginning. I think this is where the con part of this comes in because just as of today, March 27th, when we're recording this, um, Mike Mitchell, the GOAT of spring football, uh, talked about that uh, predictions for week one TV ratings. And this is where I am kind of shocked by this. The Birmingham Stallions at Renegades this upcoming Saturday on Fox, he is predicting 850,000 viewers. And then the Battle Hawks versus the Panthers at 4 p.m. would gain viewership but would have 887,000 viewers. Sunday, March 31st on uh, Easter on ESPN. Uh, He's almost taking about half the viewership, 450,000 for the Defenders and Brahmas at noon, and then the Showboats and Roughnecks at 3 p.m., 420,000 viewership there. And to me, that is a huge con for this league if that were to happen. Because when we look at it, we all know that last year um, with the championship games, the uh, 10-game regular season average for XFL-wise, 622,000 viewers per game on ESPN, ESPN2, ABC, FX, and ESPN+. Um, The eight games on ABC averaged 1.13 million viewers. So, again, if there was eight games on over-the-broadcast television averaging uh, 1.13, to me, this is a huge downgrade if the UFL is only getting 800,000 viewers for that first game. When we know the opening games for most of the spring football leagues going back to 2020 with the XFL have got over a million views each time. So I think that's where... A huge con comes into play, and you have your hand up. Go ahead with that. Other than whenever you went down to Birmingham, have they played on Easter weekend? Like, do we have those numbers? Because I'm curious if the numbers are skewed because it's a holiday weekend, too. Like, I know, obviously, that Birmingham Birmingham had games that year because you went down to that for Easter Sunday. And that was, what, two years ago? Three years two ago? Two years ago, okay. yep. So I know that there's there should be some numbers for that game in that weekend. And I'm curious to see if they're taking numbers from that season to show that. Because I'm also curious if they played last year on Easter Sunday. I can't remember because these kids take all of my brain cells. <laughs> so... Easter Sunday, yes, they did play on Easter Sunday last year. Only reason I remember that is because we were um, at your mom's house. and Oh, yeah, and she doesn't get the, <laughs> the channels for No, it. she did have the channels. She It was on ESPN. Uh, this was the XFL, not the USFL had not started yet. But I remember watching it with uh, our niece and nephew and our kids or whatnot, and we were talking about the XFL and... All that type of stuff. So they were on Easter. I'll check out that number. But going back to two years ago in 2022 with the uh, USFL kicking off. So on Fox, the actually, you know what? This is not correct. The article I pulled up is from last year uh, ratings. 
that is not 2022. I meant to put that up. Um, but anyway, so as I talk this through, basically, I think there's been every single year, 2022, 2023, and now 2024, where they will be playing on Easter Sunday. And I'll try to pull up the XFL ratings for last year as well because I do think that would be an interesting comparison because maybe that is where Mike Mitchell is getting those numbers um, I just find it very I find it very odd to say the least that the UFL with two combined leagues the XFL and USFL would only get the same viewership that the USFL was getting and we're not taking in consideration the XFL viewership Something seems off with that prediction, but I, again, I'm not quite sure where Mike Mitchell is getting that essentially. The, the predicted numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the numbers for that. So when we look at the USFL opener on Fox, uh, which was Easter weekend, it was simulcast. That's another problem with the thing is too. This is a little skewed. It was simulcast on Fox and NBC. The USFL... Fox game averaged 1.757 million viewers with a 0.33 rating. And then the USFL game telecast on NBC averaged 1.3 million demographics. So technically, overall, the the Saturday night debut game was in primetime. We don't have a primetime game this uh, this weekend. But it averaged 3.6 or 3.067 million viewers. That's massive. How are we cutting that? So, and again, primetime does kind of take into effect there. But in that demo, Fox still got 1.757. Then we look at the remaining uh, games in that weekend on the Sunday doubleheader, which was essentially on NBC and USA and FS1. Now, of course... There's another factor here. There was weather delays with that. I remember sitting in a cafe across the street from Protective Stadium while it poured rain. We could barely get into the stadium. Uh, the NBC broadcast of the Panthers Gamblers game delivered 2.153 million viewers as more viewership numbers became available. Um, the weather delayed caused a significant depletion of expected crowd, as we all know that. Um, but the overall number of Sunday on NBC was a very positive one, especially for the games being held on Easter Sunday. So, and that's the thing too, like when you looked at the second half of that game on Sunday, the New Orleans Breakers and the Philadelphia Stars on USA Network averaged 771,000 viewers with a 0, uh, 0 0.11 uh, in the 18-49 to 49 adult demo. That's the big part here is... We're still looking at this. Now, of course, the fourth game was kind of out there because it got canceled and then pushed to Monday Night Football at a random time on FS1 with the Tampa Bay Bandits and the Pittsburgh Maulers at 7 p.m. Eastern time, averaged 268,000 viewers. The telecast was ranked 90 out of 150 cable shows. I don't think that's a fair comparison because... That most likely is not going to happen with any of the games this weekend because the only outdoor games we're having is the Houston Roughnecks game on Sunday and the Arlington Renegades on Saturday. Both games are in Texas. It's expected to be very hot <laughs> out um, in Texas. And then the other two games are in the Alamo Dome and Ford Field in Michigan. Those will not have weather issues because they're domes. So... That's where I'm kind of confused with Mike Mitchell's predictions here. And that could be a huge con. If the numbers are that low, that could be a con for Fox and for ESPN and all them when they're looking at numbers. Especially on Easter, if the numbers are down to 400,000. That is troubling. And I don't know what their gear or target is for opening weekend. But I would assume it's got to be over a million for some of these games, especially when you have the Arlington Renegades, the defending XFL champions from 2023, and then you have the two-time defending USFL champions, the Birmingham Stallions, in a matchup I've talked about for weeks on months 
probably the last <laughs> year of what we've wanted is only getting 800 some odd thousand viewership for like the biggest like versus thing it's like Monday Night Nitro versus the WWE Raw back in the day that simulcast when v- the worthless piece of crap Vince McMahon bought WCW that was a huge rating factor um, for that and I think this is kind of one of those things of merging that those numbers should be significant enough to get what the XFL was getting in 2023 I mean the opening weekend for the XFL um, TV rating wise and I'm pulling that up here the opening game February 18th, and this is what really drives me up a wall about what Mike Mitchell is predicting, is because the Arlington Renegades and the Las Vegas Vipers (laughs) averaged 1.57 million viewers on ABC on February 18th last year on a Sunday afternoon. So, again, we're looking at the same type of, not obviously the same time frame of month-wise, but same type of day. And everything like that, where then the Saturday night game was on ESPN and FX featuring the Roughnecks and Guardians, averaged 751,000 on ESPN and 390,000 on FX. So essentially, that got over a million views, technically speaking, for both games. I'm not quite sure why we would expect such a drop when marketing has been higher on. Fox for this inaugural game. I think that's kind of crazy to me, but... Under promise, overperform. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm looking up the XFL 2023 Easter ratings, which I believe was week eight of the XFL, if I'm not mistaking. Uh... Was it April 11th, Easter yes. last year? Let me look it up. Okay, so yes, it did. Oh. So, sorry. So, what happened in week eight? So, Saturday, I uh, had the Battle Hawks in Vegas on ESPN, 868,000. Saturday, Orlando and Arlington on ESPN, 679,000. And then Sunday on ABC, you had San Antonio versus Houston. 1 million viewers, and then Seattle, D.C. that night on ESPN2, 487,000. And that was week 8. What were the dates? Uh, April 11th and 12th, I think. Oh, I'm showing Sunday, April 9th. 9th. Okay, so maybe this was wrote on April. Okay. Oh, it is. Okay, so it was wrote on April 11th, but Easter was the 9th, so games were on the 8th and 9th last year. So again... You're still looking at huge numbers compared to what Mike Mitchell is predicting. So it just seems weird to me that you have two different fan bases and you're telling me that half of them dropped, potentially half of them dropped off with the merger. I think that could be a big con if that is the actual case. That'll be remain to be seen. You can catch all that data on Tuesday on the comeback period on YouTube. We'll be talking about that. Um, But this officially wraps up episode one. Let me know in the comments what you think are pros and cons. Now, we've talked about this on the comeback period, but do you agree? And who had the better story here? So we're going to tally up every week, comments, likes, everything like that. I'll put a poll up as well. Who had the better for better for worse? Did I have the better for the con version or did... Uh, my wife have the better pro version for the merger, the great merger per se. And then we look forward to weekend games and seeing where everything goes for Easter weekend. So uh, let me know in the comments and we'll see you back here on For Better, For Worse. I'm your ho- co-host, Brandon Anderson. And I'm Angie. Have a great Easter. Later, everyone. Bye.